Hi there, welcome. I'm Bob Thompson and I'd like to welcome you to the Philanthropic Planner Program. Those of you who have seen us before, we talk about that boring subject, philanthropy. Those that are new, uh, let me fill you in. We try to provide a friendly forum to promote the dialogue of the significance and importance of philanthropy to the local community, to the state, region, country, and internationally, globally. Uh, we want to do away with legalese. Uh, that's not important. And we want to talk about you and me as philanthropists. You don't have to be a multi-multi-millionaire to be a philanthropist. We can volunteer. We can do a lot of things. But uh, one thing we need to do more, we need to talk more about the importance of philanthropy in the community. Now, usually I start off and uh, we talk about local events, uh, charitable fundraising, races, uh, that kind of thing. We talk about uh, things that are in the paper, but if you look at your local paper, in our case, the Valley Press, you'll see almost on every page some type of fundraising, some, some aspect of, of philanthropy. So we encourage you to uh, not only look at that, uh, but talk about it. Uh, with your friends, your associates, your, your family. And uh, we just need to promote more dialogue about uh, philanthropy. But we're gonna skip all of that. I don't have a lot of time this morning to get into some of those stories because we have a guest today. And I uh, usually have trouble with the title of this program. And those of you who have seen uh, Stupid Bob and Crazy Bob and, and joking and, and all that junk, okay? Uh, but I have trouble with the title. Today's title, I talked about um, the many faces of philanthropy and subtitle on that, the power of collaboration. Now, full disclosure, before I introduce our guest, uh, about two weeks ago, I'm on a, a Monday morning, not Monday morning, uh, uh, a foundation board meeting. And this happens about every, every month. And after that meeting, I'm thinking, I know who my next guest should be on the Philanthropic Planner Program. Uh, I'd like to introduce today Jacqueline Farnham. Jackie, I've known for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, it goes back a long time ago when she was nine <laughs> and she became the executive director of the Financial Planners Association. Uh, but she's here today as the Executive Director of Advisors and Philanthropy Foundation. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for taking the time, even though I twisted your arm. And uh, uh, Jackie's a wonderful person. And, and uh, further disclosure is before we went to Chicago, we just got back at an Advisor and Philanthropy uh, annual conference in Chicago. But two weeks ago, before this uh, meeting, uh, I thought Jackie would be an ideal guest. Let's talk about the foundation. Now, yes. uh, you have, I'm gonna say a handicap, you have uh, an experience that's very valuable because you've worked with financial planners right. in the Connecticut. 19 years. Or 19 year. years, I was gonna say 20 and you started when you were nine, but uh, <laughs> 19 years and Jackie, knows, I would say, most of the financial planners, at least the members of the association in the state of Connecticut. Right. But you have the distinct, uh, a unique experience also in this philanthropy aspect of it. Right. Now tell us about the foundation. Well, the foundation's mission is to educate advisors in philanthropy, and we do that uh, through scholarships primarily. Um, we also are starting an initiative to educate the public, and part of the reason why I'm here, um, about what a chartered advisor in philanthropy is. Charter advisor in philanthropy, that's uh, kind of new. Uh, CPAs we know, we know attorneys, we know this. Chartered advisor in philanthropy, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, the American College of Financial Services provides a designation. They have eight different designations, and the public may be aware of some of them, such as CHFC or CLU. Um, Chartered Advisor in Philanthropy, or CAP, is their, their newest designation. Uh, I just checked in this morning uh, to see how many total designees across the country are 1,042. 
and there are 20 here in the state of Connecticut. 20 in Connecticut, 1,042 across the country. Right. And I might add, Jackie is a CAP. Just got my CAP. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and I really, I haven't had an opportunity to, to say that, but uh, I'm really proud of, of you doing that. Uh, Jackie is an administrator for associations. She has a number of association clients. Uh, association alternatives or? Correct. Okay. I didn't know if I'd get that right. But here's a professional uh, manager of associations. And one of the associations is a, f a foundation advisors in philanthropy. And uh, Jackie's thought so much of it. Uh, tell us more. What motivated you to get a CAP? Well, I'll tell you, the people in that organization are just very giving, loving people. They walk the talk. Is that? Um, and they are givers, and they believe in what they're doing. And they believe in a theory of abundance and not competition. And they believe that in, in sharing this information and, and incentivizing more financial planners and more attorneys and CPAs and insurance rep reps to seek their chartered advisor in philanthropy, they'll be talking to their clients more about philanthropy and they'll all be speaking the same language. The, the advisors at the table around a donor um, or a client will all know the same language as well as the nonprofit that might be the donor's passion or charity of choice, um, those people are also becoming CAPs. Now, you mentioned these advisors or attorneys, accountants, uh, financial planners, insurance people, trust officers, they, they cover. All of them. And, and we'll get into this in a little bit more, but also development uh, professionals. The nonprofits. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and they're getting the CAP. Right. Community foundations, right. representatives there, donor advised funds. And I'm kind of getting ahead of my, myself because I want to I want to talk about this meeting, but I did want to preface, uh, and my sole motivation before was to get Jackie to come in and talk about the CAP. Uh, but then we have this Chicago event, and this mm -hmm. is how many years now? Oh, um, at least it's, I think eight years it's been been going on for AIP, for AIP, and then prior to that, the National Association of Philanthropic Planners, and prior Merged. to that, a NARA National Association of Renaissance uh, Advisors. Mm -hmm. So that goes back, and I'm showing my age now. That goes back about eighty years or something. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a long history of these. Uh, I'll use your term, uh, passionate advisors that are interested in, in, in the betterment of the community because that's exactly. really what it's all about is, is uh, uh, improving and, and providing services uh, to the needy and that covers a lot of waterfront. And just Let's jump into this uh, meeting in Chicago. Um, you had a meeting uh, an all-day meeting at the Aquaturf for financial right. planners on Wednesday. Wednesday. So you got to Chicago uh, half a day late. Thursday morning. Uh, and if I can just interject here real quick, uh, the half day before with Phil Cabetta from the American College and this open space uh, uh, program that he had was very, very, very good, uh, very uh, impressive because, um, and part of the reason for the, uh, my title to today's program, The Many Faces of Philanthropy, had to do with this, uh, this group that was in this open space uh, uh, forum. And uh, it was impressive, all the different, uh, what I used to call silos, that now they're telling me, Pop, don't, don't say silo. It's uh, these networking groups, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll still call them silos, I, you know. Uh, old habits. I can't change an old dog's tricks here. But uh, when we talk about these different silos, and uh, if you're an outsider and you come in and you're overwhelmed at how many different organizations and associations and interest groups uh, there are, and uh, it's uh, it's eye-opening when you when you see it. And as far as designations, too, there's a lot. It's very confusing for the public sometimes to understand what each silo, yeah. what their role is. That's a good point. That's a good point. We, we don't know who 
the advisor is or the development uh, officer and so on uh, and where they're coming from and what, what their interests are. But uh, the power of collaboration, um, you were uh, the um, executive director of AIP for a while. Mm -hmm. um, they changed their name. They changed their name to the International Association uh, and, and I sat beside a gentleman from India. Right. Uh, so what do we have? We have Canada, India, Australia, Australia mm -hmm. and now this big thing about China. China. Tell, tell us about uh, what we're doing in China. Well, there's been some collaboration between leaders in China who want to increase philanthropy and giving uh, in, in business in China, collaborating with Americans and coming to our conference on philanthropy to learn how we're doing it and vice versa. We sent representatives over there to their conference to create a dialogue and uh, they don't have a chartered advisor and philanthropy designation over there. Neither does Canada. So America's one of the first and this is a really a grassroots movement um, and we hope to be able to make it an international movement. Now our, our past president uh, is from Canada, right? Yes, en Enzo. Enzo. Um, this, uh, I was fascinated, this gentleman from China that uh, I was visiting with, he said in 2005, not that long ago, 2005, that there was like one nonprofit organization or, or just a very small, a very limited uh, uh, entity, uh, agency, a nonprofit agency. And today, I mean, the wealth the growing wealth is incredible, but these right. wealthy people want to know what we're doing and how to help their community. So it, it's an interesting, and uh, it'll be uh, interesting to see if we can get the CAP designation over there. I think we will. I think yeah. we will. So. Uh, some of the programs. Uh, if I had two or three of these programs to talk about uh, just this one Chicago program, I was very impressed. and. Maybe one of the reasons was I missed the last two, uh, oh. which, which I won't, I missed the last two meetings, but I was blown away by some of these speakers. Yeah, I had a, I had a kind of aha, aha moment where, you know, you have, usually there's some takeaways and you want to bring something back and apply it. And for me, that was when um, these, the Volkswagen, Auburn Volkswagen people from Seattle came in and talked about their uh, cause marketing, which is a term that I had never heard before. And I want to be able to bring back and, and, and talk about it a little bit more because all their marketing is done around their, their philanthropy. And, and whether it's raising money for a cause or uh, getting some attention um, for a cause, that's what they do in their commercials. Different causes. Different causes. Different groups, uh, either groups that they were already interested in right. or Came to them. new groups coming to them and their business is a Volkswagen auto agency. And uh, he's taken it from scratch in a very short period of time, uh, became the largest in his local area and then state and region. I think he's like the second largest Volkswagen dealership in the country now. He said that people come 50 miles to his dealership because of his philanthropy, yeah. and it's it's well known, and I agreed with that. I would go 50 miles to uh, to buy a Volkswagen from him f because he's so generous. We saw a couple trailers, uh, commercials, of uh, of his um, really advertising and marketing his his automobiles, but all around these uh, charitable causes, and they've raised millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they're working with a chartered advisor in philanthropy. Is that right? I, <laughs> yes, I up didn't in know the that. Seattle area. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, any other programs that stuck out for you? Um, that was that was the best. But you know, as as you know, we did a, a, a foundation fundraiser. We did several different fundraisers, and we were able to raise nine thousand, just over nine thousand dollars from just within our own group for the foundation to give out additional scholarships. Um, in the past year, we've also applied for some grants. We How many scholarships? Uh, now, this is from the foundation, mm -hmm. and the scholarships are for these, I guess we didn't talk about the number of courses that uh, you take with right. the American College, but there are three uh, courses. Right. So it could take as much as three years to get this uh, designation, but yes. um, 
Uh, it took a year and a half for it's, me. It's yeah. um, a year and a half for you. Well, you're a, a quick learner. Uh. Well, I had a little <laughs> bit of financial planning background, and I had the nonprofit. True, true. So. Now, the scholarships are to pay for part of the tuition for the American College? Right. They're, they're one-time scholarships, $500 scholarships. Um, we actually we get more scholarships than, than we can support, and there's a lot of deserving Applications. people. Applications. Applications, yeah. right, than we can support. Uh, at this time, so we're trying to grow the foundation now so that we can incent incentivize more people to go ahead and get their Chartered Advisor in Philanthropy. Now, we have several advisors, uh, both in the association itself and affiliated with the foundation, yeah. several advisors that have had clients of theirs right. that have contributed uh, substantial money uh, to promote uh, the designation and they know, I guess by dealing with their personal advisors, well, uh, what they've done with philanthropy. CAPs um, sometimes become the most trusted advisor with a client because they go into a, a deeper level with their clients. And so when the, the financial planner, the insurance agent, uh, whoever that trusted advisor is, that CAP is, hears, um, I wish there were more advisors like you. Mm. Mm. that's an opportunity to say there can be, yeah. and right in your own community. And what's happening with a CAP is localized study groups, because one of the best things about CAP is that it creates collaboration among the, peop the, the advisors at the table in your own community. So there are study groups throughout the country. Um, I, there's about 15 different study groups right now throughout the country that are meeting to and, and, graduate CAPS. And because of this collaboration, and, and you get a feeling all through this that even though you're in the same uh, profession, the same business, it, it's not competition. No. It's one of, the focus is on the donor client and the betterment of the, of the community. Right. And uh, these scholarships make it available. Uh, share with the, our audience, what uh, I was impressed with our last uh, foundation board meeting where we had, uh, what, 14 applications? There were 12. Uh, and from, Two more since then. <laughs> from uh, eight different states. Right. And three or four of those, maybe five, were attorneys. Mm -hmm. And this is all over the country. All we're getting applications country. from all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and this group that's collaborating and everything, they're, they're interested in forming chapters right. of advisors in philanthropy. Uh, right. And we're seeing, uh, I think we heard at the end of the conference in Chicago that uh, uh, a number, Dave Holliday, I believe, uh, did you go to that yes, session? Yes, I did, yeah. And, and uh, having chapters. So uh, I guess the onus is on uh, you and me to kind of get this uh, it is. ball rolling and you've been yeah. waiting on me. Well, I have a uh, few financial ad advisors I've already spoke to with the their members of the Financial Planning Association here in Connecticut that have indicated some interest. And and that's where it really needs to um, it needs to the advisors and some may say, you know, I'm you'd like to make a donation to your foundation, um, but you know, why should I be supporting for-profit advisors to well, because Otherwise, they may not know about it. This is an incentive to get in, get them in there, and this is the best way to increase giving in your community is to, to educate the advisors who are already working right. with clients and donors um, to speak this language and to be able to talk to their clients about philanthropy. Uh, so. and, it, and this course, uh, CAP, uh, Charter Advisor in Philanthropy, um, really is the feedback and when I took the uh, the course uh, it gives the advisor an opportunity to more to know more about what the development nonprofit uh, professional exactly. is doing and vice versa which is very important for the nonprofit uh, professional to know what motivates uh, and how what's the interest of, of the advisor right. um, so there there is that power of collaboration that, that comes out of that right. I uh, it's it's interesting to to see um, see somebody get the uh, the disease. I guess yeah is uh, it is contagious. Uh, it is contagious. Yes. And, and 
you see, uh, let me let me come back. Uh, this goes rather quickly, and I I don't want to miss the opportunity to uh, the the last session, the last keynote of of Karen uh, Moyer. Um, her husband, a professional baseball player, uh, and they have started uh, a foundation, and they have uh, Aaron Camps, Camp Aaron. And Camp Aaron is, they have 41 of these camps now across the country, and they want to have hundreds. But Camp Aaron is, is dedicated to young, young children that uh, uh, are in the grieving uh, state, and, and they've lost a loved one, they've lost a family member, they've lost a sibling, uh, they're, they're grieving. Uh, and these camps are just uh, multiplying across the country. Kind of exciting to, to see that and uh, uh, this husband and wife team and the foundation. Uh, Jamie Moyer uh, played for the Philadelphia uh, baseball team and uh, a lot of his career in Seattle Mariners. And uh, I just found out, I came back and talked to Rob after the conference and I said, do you, do you know uh, of this baseball player? He's the oldest uh oldest active baseball player. I mean, he was like 49 and he was still playing. <laughs> uh, but the cities, the teams, the different teams that he played for uh, still rally around this guy and are promoting uh, the foundation. But the other camp is um, Camp Mariposa, I think it's called. And that's where uh, children are come to the camp and these are children that are um, in families or in environment uh, of addiction, uh, uh, drugs, alcohol, and that type of thing where these children are exposed to that and they're abused in many cases. And I just thought uh, her presentation was uh, uh, very passionate, very involved, and I could just see how those camps have, have grown. One added point here, and, and this brings it back to local, is that uh, in June, in a couple months, uh, Camp Aaron will be in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, and again, this is uh, the grieving uh, uh, program. And uh, we'll be in Newtown visiting with uh, children and families in the community. Uh, Jackie, um, anything else from uh, uh, Chicago or? Well, in relation to that story, I, I just think that never underestimate the power that one person can have. You, everybody can make a difference. Good point. Good point. Um, not, it, what, it, the difference between someone who's a giver and someone who's a philanthropist is that a philanthropist gets involved with what they're doing and, and is hands-on. And, and it may not necessarily mean giving a lot of money. It may mean giving of your time. Right. Um, that's just as important. Studies have shown from the Templeton Foundation, we had Stephen Post in a couple of years ago speaking about um, actually, actually the physiological, what happens when you give and when you volunteer. Um, and people who give and volunteer are happier people. It, it is contagious. And you yes. can see how it, um, a, a giver, maybe an annual contribution, and from that writing out the check, they are either asked or they volunteer to get more involved, and the more involved, it, it just snowballs into uh, bringing friends and colleagues into it. And we find that locally with the fundraisers of uh, the, the running and, and the walking and, and that type of thing, uh, bringing attention to uh, cancer, breast cancer, uh, other, other diseases and that type of thing. And they get involved and they see that other people uh, have that in common. You know, they, they, uh, they bond because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in America, we have this unique uh, thing that uh, we can bond together for causes like that. And we just need to, to know that uh, there's an incredible demand, but we have limited money, mm -hmm. limited resources. And yet the uh, irony is, and you and I talk about that in the board and our different groups, that there is so much 
money out there, affluence out there. Mm -hmm. And I have a number of clients that, that will say, Bob, I would like to do more. I would like to do more if I knew how. Well, that doing more is capacity. Do they have the capacity to give more? Mm -hmm. And knowing how is to have these professional advisors right. that kind of walk them through the how. And many people now want to give while they're living, too. One of the most popular ways to give is a bequest in your will. In the will. But, right. Mm -hmm. But now more people are wanting to give and see the effect of their philanthropy. Yeah. So that's a, a, also a, a new movement, and, and they want to leave a legacy. Leaving a legacy, and we could do an, 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 a lot more programs on that, uh, but an interesting thing that was brought up in Chicago meeting a number of times was this generational effect and how parents and grandparents involve their children and grandchildren, right. and how the, the millennials, for example, uh, born between 1980 and 2000, how they are taking on uh, philanthropy in a different way than their mm -hmm. parents and grandparents, which is kind of exciting because yeah. they are more involved. They want to know, is the charity effective? Uh, they are getting more involved in the, in the, the operational. Uh, they know the finances. They know whether they're delivering the, the donation dollar and that well, type of thing. The first course in CAP teaches... Um, planning for philanthropic impact in the context of family wealth and it, and it really brings the whole family into the planning process for philanthropy and involves the children. It's a way to pass your values down to to your children and grandchildren. Right and, and again talking about the joy of giving when you're involving children and grandchildren you can just see the older generation enjoying it so much that uh, and this this Karen Moyer uh, was a good example she had her daughter there who's a a freshman at St. Mary's at South Bend mm -hmm. and everything. Jackie, I, I appreciate you taking the time. I hope Anytime. that I didn't uh, throw you any curveballs or what have no, you, but I fun. think you're a great representative of seeing what's out there and then getting involved and then going to uh, the effort of getting the Chartered Advisor and Philanthropy designation and uh, staying involved in, in the foundation itself. And hopefully you and I can uh, cross uh, simulate or what have you uh, uh, with these different organizations whether it's the financial planners mm -hmm. and getting them more involved in the all-day conference and philanthropy and so on so right we're working uh, on that we need to do that okay right thanks for coming thank you. and I appreciate you taking the time uh, you've been you've been great thank you Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.